Welcome. We're live. Young Jerks. Only on WEMFradio.com. And this is uh, Mike Can sitting in with Frank Frank Capone. Capone. Here I am. How's everybody doing? Happy uh, almost 4th of July. Yeah. And we are the Young Jerks, uh, brought to you by Greenleaf Magazine. Pick it up. It's free. Yeah. Thank you, Greenleaf Magazine. And uh, this week we have... uh, Something that we were plugging last week. Switching it up. Switching it up a little bit. Getting into, uh, I don't know, a story that's, uh, it's a long, it it happened many years ago, but uh, it's funny to see, like, uh, we brought this story up. Uh, We've been checking, I've been checking it out. I discovered this on the web. I didn't even know anything about it. And uh, I thought it would be interesting. And then uh, all of a sudden the Boston Herald is posting a story yesterday related to this story, which is kind of strange. No kidding. Yeah, the uh, what, you know what we're talking about today is the uh, Krista Worthington uh, murder investigation that resulted in a conviction, and there's a lot of controversy around that trial, which I'd never realized. I, I had seen you know the stories when it came out, but I never really followed it. I didn't really know much about it. But uh, a website that I was checking out uh, by an, a gentleman named Kevin Mulvey uh, enlightened me to many things related to this court case. And uh, the investigation that uh, showed a lot of local fraud, fraud in the prosecution, um, bad things happening, uh, evidence being ignored, testimony being ignored, it's being suppressed, evidence being suppressed. Lots bad things happening. Lots and lots of layers. To this yeah, story. lots of layers. And uh, Kevin Mulvey has a website that he's really brought up a lot of this information and uh this happened in Ca- on cape cod uh back in uh, i think it was 2000 well the the, the, the whole t- jury trial you know went out, went throughout the you know mid 2000s but you know this thing has been going on the whole the the corruption in cape cod has been going on for years apparently uh you know a lot of uh if you look back at Cape Cod, it's always been known. I mean, go back to Joe Kennedy bootlegging, hey, right? Hey, right? Wait. When they bootlegging back then, and you know, there's always been that kind of contraband pirate thing going on in Cape Cod. And uh, recently, where this whole murder investigation happened, where this murder happened in Truro, the police, the former police, the uh, f- former police chief of uh, Truro, was arrested for drunk driving. It just came up on the Herald, and it's it's just a pattern of corruption down there that you'll you'll see. And a lot of this was covered up for years, and uh, it's, it's, it looks like it's coming to the surface again. And the reason we want to talk, you know, the reason we're talking about this today is because we got to speak to Kevin Mulvey. Kevin Mulvey is uh, somebody that is related to uh, his nephew, is Sean Mulvey, who was a uh, witness in the case. He testified in this case. He was also somebody who was a suspect. In Krista Worthington's murder, his nephew, Kevin Mulvey's uh, nephew, Sean Mulvey, uh, along with uh, his friend Jeremy Frazier. And both of these gentlemen changed their story several times about where they were, how they got where they were that night. And that automatically would be a red flag, I think, in any murder investigation when someone changes their story, when they have lied to the authorities. Would you agree with that, Frank? I mean, of course it is. Yeah. Of course it is. And, I mean, as the, as you had brought up, you know, when we were speaking about it before... The guy who ended up getting convicted of it had what an IQ of I think it was seventy six. Seventy six. Yeah. So they put this, you know, the the the, the supposed uh, person who was convicted in a room, and they questioned him for like eight hours. Yeah. And he changed his story like four or five times. And he had an IQ of you know under a hundred, <laughs> well under a hundred. Yeah. You know, the average person is a hundred, and I, I I look at the average person. Are they intelligent enough to? Uh, <laughs> You know, withstand questioning from the police, I think not. And yeah. someone with a, an IQ way below the average person. And in terms of, like, motive and things like that, I mean, where was, you know, where was, what did the guy stand to gain from doing it? Like, as far as I could tell, nothing, right? Well, they made it to be, like, a sex crime. Like, there's a, you know, a black man killed oh, a classic, white woman classic. to have sex with her. I mean, that classic. was how they, you know, set up the whole thing. Um but we, we're going to definitely get into this because the person that we really want to speak to today about this, Kevin Mulvey, uh, hopefully we do get him on the phone. And, you know, just just how deep this goes. I mean, this goes so many different la- layers. We could go on and on. Um, personally, I've seen, you know, and, and, and where Kevin goes with this is that he thinks that Sean Mulvey, his, his nephew, and Jeremy Frazier were confidential police informants. And that they were the real culprits, that they committed the murder, and that they have been protected by the police because the police were paying them as as drug informants. 
And there's a lot of evidence of that. When you look at the court case, you can see the testimony. You can see the attorney uh, that was representing the man convicted questioning Jeremy Frazier on the stand. And we have that clip today. We're going to play that clip today. Questioning Jeremy Frazier about his past arrest and why he was never prosecuted. About Jeremy Frazier getting a call from the state police the night that Krista Worthington was murdered. All these things. And and even beyond that, uh, the, the attorney also had questions about... Jeremy Frazier, who owned the phone? Did you see that part, Frankie? Yeah, who did own the phone? Yeah, well, Jeremy Frazier was definitely, is definitely, you know, it, it, I think, you know, it's obvious he was selling drugs, right? He's got a phone. It's, he, he got the phone from his coworker who he worked with at a moving company called Dave Murphy. Dave Murphy was from Somerville, Mass. Dave Murphy was convicted for manslaughter, but was originally charged with murder one. He, he, allegedly and was convicted of manslaughter for this murder and basically what happened is uh they found a body with no head and no legs and uh it it, it happened at the somerville holiday inn and they found the body in new hampshire and dave murphy went down for it and dave murphy was part of the uh, winter hill gang i was just borrowing dave's phone yeah, that's a different Dave Murphy. <laughs> we know a Dave Murphy. <laughs> Very funny. common name. I mean, that's what's tough when you look up. For the, it's funny that we, because we, you know, I was been looking up some of these names, and some of them are, uh, you can actually find some of these people still out there. But uh, Dave Murphy is a hard one to find, obviously, because right. that name is so common. But uh, the Dave Murphy that we're talking about, Jeremy Frazier had Dave Murphy's phone. And Dave Murphy was a convicted murderer with the Whitey Bulger, Winter Hill Gang, and the police didn't think anything of it. Why? Because Jeremy Frazier was also a police informant. Huh. How is that? Yeah. And that's what we're going to get into, because uh, Kevin Mulvey's got so much information on this, and he's the one who brought a lot of this to light to myself, and uh, he just doesn't, you know, make up these things and make these accusations. You know, he does go way further than this that I don't even want to touch because I don't have all the evidence. But what Kevin does, has done for me and myself, is shown us the documents, show show you the testimony. It's so obvious when you hear uh, Jeremy Frazier that he's covering something up. And we're going to play that clip today. But uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a quick break, listen to some music, chill for a minute, and then we're going to come back. Hopefully we'll have Kevin Mulvey on the phone and uh, we'll get all into this and, and find out what what uh, Jeremy uh, no um, what Sean Mulvey, his nephew, said to Kevin that made Kevin think that uh, he might have had something to do with this murder of Krista Worthington. We're going to find out directly from Kevin when we get back from this break. And this is the Young Jerks on WEMF and prepare to go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, and if this is your <laughs> first time listening to our show, please do... Uh, subscribe on our Facebook, like us. I noticed some people from Cape Cod were liking uh, the event page today and, and probably listening for the first time. Please like our Facebook page and, and uh, check us out every week, 6 p.m. WEMF Radio. And uh, we'll be back. WEMF Radio. We're back. Live, the Young Jerks. Sure. And that was Tupac. That's right, on WEMF Radio. It's a good so, song too about the government. The government is watching, but we're not afraid. Is that that's pretty right. much the uh, the feeling around here? Is they can watch us all we want, but um, we ha- we have live on the telephone Kevin Mulvey, who uh, we had talked about. Kevin, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and tell us why you think that Sean, your your nephew Sean has something to do with this Krista Worthington mu- murder? Okay, uh, how you doing, Mike and Frank? Awesome, awesome. Good. Uh, listen, um, to me, try to spitball this story to you. Um, my brother and uh, nephew, and they're, they're, they are estranged. Uh, my brother had contacted me back on the weekend of the murder, and I was uh, visiting in the Berkshires, and my career is really in New York City, and that's where I lived for over 40 years in uh, Columbus Circle as a producer producing television. And my brother had called up and asked me to, if I'd fly to Florida, because I owned a condo down there as well, to help him look for an apartment or condominium right away, because of his son always getting into nothing but trouble with his friends. So he said that he was really in a, a bit of a scramble. He was very upset. This went on for a couple of hours. And I, I did fly down there three weeks later and met him in Florida, where we started looking around for condominiums for him and his son to move to. And uh, I went down a couple more times during that that, uh, time period. 
and uh, to look for a condo. And uh, when I did come down um, on one of my visits, uh, late 2002, early 2003, Sean came by and visited with me and happened to mention that he did the worst, worst, worst thing he could ever do to anybody or anything. And uh, he said, I did it. So I said, well, whatever that was, you know, you go ahead and make up 20 times for whatever, whatever that was, and now you're down here now and move on with your life. I didn't want to know anything more than that. Uh, you know, I don't need to be complicit in something that somebody might be involved in something serious. At any rate, he said, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, I'm in this, you know, kind of like a mercenary group that we didn't, you know, people want to forget to do some things like this. And I said, well, I don't want to know about it. <laughs> it's quite simple. So if I, I could, if I could cut the... you off real quick, Kevin. Um, sure. How did that, ha- how did that come up in conversation? Like, what was, what were you like, oh, yeah, it's nice outside. I'm glad the rain's gone. By the way, I did the most terrible yeah, thing. We, yeah. Face we, were, we were sitting and chatting in, uh, in my condominium down in Florida. I was only there for a, a week or two to visit. And he just brought it up, and we were getting into conversations. And, you know, he, he's, he's got issues. Sean does have issues. He's, you know, he's, uh, you know, pathological liar. He's done a lot of stealing uh, from not only uh, breaking and entering type of stuff when he was a teenager, but also set up his own father and stole from his own grandmother, his sister. Um, <laughs> you know, he's got, he's got problems. And uh, what about and, the uh, father? What, what is the background on, the, on his father, Sean? Unfortunately, on your... my, my brother's always been a, what we call the high strung. And unfortunately, he was arrested for stalking. He was the fire chief out there in uh, East Ham, Mass. Okay. And he'd come from West Haven, Connecticut, as the uh, commissioner or uh, assistant commissioner of the fire department down in West Haven, Connecticut, where he had been arrested for stalking and had some serious issues and got convicted. That was your brother. Was, yeah. John, and, yeah. Uh, Sean's, they, Sean's they father. He lost his job in East Ham over that. And um, I was very concerned about his continued problems with stalking uh, women, and um, I thought it would be a good idea to go down to Florida because I thought maybe it would get him out of this. And uh, big mistake. We got targeted by COINTELPRO, by the FBI, as a result of this, and not knowing unbeknownst to us because I didn't know anything about the Crystal Worthington murder. I just knew he was involved in something, but I didn't know who or what. Um, in the meantime, my business got infiltrated. My partner's business got infiltrated. And he's an Academy Award winner for Norman Rockwell's World, the American Dream, and a triple uh, Emmy winner for uh, an ABC special and, you know, a couple hundred other awards. I mean, you're talking some substantial careers here. And um, unfortunately, I found that right before 2004, my... My business had been infiltrated. I knew that something was going on, but I couldn't understand what it was that was happening there. Tell us how you figured it out, how you figured out the, the well, day you figured it out. The day I didn't, I didn't figure it out until really during, um, I, I, got, I got the IRS coming after me in a heavy in, in, uh, involvement at the end of 2004. And this was at the same time that the uh, Massachusetts State Police were setting up that situation out there in Truro where they were doing DNA swabs on all these guys out there from 18 to 64 years old. And um, they were setting me up to a situation where economically I was being ruined over a two or three year time period not knowing what was going on. IRS all of a sudden starts coming after me, so I decided what I'd do is subdirect my space out in Manhattan at Columbus Circle and go down temporarily, hopefully, and only and live in the condo down in Clearwater, Florida. And, um, you know, hopefully things would straighten out with production. I'd be able to come back up again. Well, within two weeks of getting there, that was the uh, April 14th, uh, Christopher McGowan gets reeled in. My brother calls me from, from his home and said, turn on the television. You're going to have to believe this. This murder that happened real close to my home. Uh, is, is a friend of Sean's, and he's been to my house many times. I thought, oh, God, please. So I turned on the television, and I looked at the cable news channels, and sure enough, they had this whole story on about this Krista Worthington murder. 
which I didn't, as I said, I didn't know who was, you know, you know, something, I knew something terrible happened, but I didn't know who or what it was. And, uh, at any rate, that's what it was all about. And, um, I don't know, at that point, my brother started saying things like, you know, he was going to give him an alibi no matter what he has to do for that kid and carrying on about all this stuff. And so, anyway, your, I'm, so your brother, I'm sorry, Kevin, is your brother was telling his son to provide an alibi for his buddy? Is that what you just said? No, no, he, actually, no, not at all. He, he, my nephew turned around and didn't provide any alibi at all. Matter at of fact, first, he said yeah. he didn't even know them. Ah, at first. You no, know, he wasn't there. At first. At first, right. he said that. Right? Right. Yeah. My brother was telling me that he'd make up, my brother would make up an alibi or anything he has to do for that kid. For Sean. For Sean, right. And let's talk about, because, I mean, we, we, there's a lot of information here. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, and, it is. It's a huge story. And that's the, well, you know, basically, the, for people that don't understand, there, you you really are making the case that the government is covering this up because Sean Mulvey was a confidential informant, a drug informant, and that Jeremy Frazier, I mean, to me, he looks like a drug informant to me. He was arrested multiple times for drugs and not not convicted, not prosecuted. He had the state police calling him that night. When Krista was murdered, that's who was calling him—the state police—and they won't really, they won't tell us what that, what all that is about. On a cell phone owned by one of Whitey Bulger's guys that was uh, sent to prison for ten years for cutting the head and hands off. For a vicious, guy, another guy. A, a vicious murder. I mean, a, a oh, vicious. Oh, you know. Plus, they were all working together. I know. Yep. Uh, over there at a moving and storage company where Krista Worthington had a storage space over there. You know, don't forget Christy Worthington's boyfriend, or not boyfriend, whatever, she, she had the baby with, Tony. Um, you know, he, he was involved in a $15 million drug deal gone bad back in 1985. That was in Peter Mansell's book. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Provincetown. He was, too. And he became a confidential informant himself. Yep. yep. You know, it, and McGowan? McGowan tried to be a confidential informant. This is the funny thing. McGowan, yeah. when they're when they're interviewing him, the guy who they convicted, the black guy, he he right. said Jeremy Frazier is a drug dealer, and I'll set him up. This is what he said to the police, and the police weren't interested. Right. Why? Because Jeremy Frazier was already a police inform. They were like, oh, we already got the bigger fish. We don't need him, right? I mean, that exactly. seemed we're gonna, so. Then you know, instead, we're going to set you up for murder because we don't want our police right. informant to go down. That's what it seemed like happened here. Is that That's you know exactly. whether or not going on there yeah i mean you you go further than that you 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 think that uh like I, I look at it maybe these guys were confidential informants they did something bad and the police got embarrassed so they covered it up well, you know could that have happened jeremy's jeremy's the state police confidential informant there <laughs> sean and him really weren't friends even according to what was even coming out there during the trial you know they didn't even have telephone calls between each other for weeks that was checked out by the lawyer at the time, <clears throat> at all. See what's going on there is, is we've got the <laughs> we've got the dist we've got the government is is is, the, is our drug dealer. There, there's 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 our big problem right here. You've got the CIA and the military bringing in the dope. You've got the FBI, DEA, and 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 all of them from state and local and county all making money off this entire scam, which is like. Uh, you know, like the days of, of, of uh, alcohol prohibition. Uh, they turned around and turned this into a huge, huge thing for themselves. There's, there's several um, other, other whistleblowers out there now that I've even come in contact with on, on Facebook that are also doing radio <clears throat> uh, on alternate media out there, like Robert Toss Plumley. He, he's the one who was flying uh, drugs and, and weapons back and forth during Iran-Contra. He's been doing a lot of uh, public speaking recently. You've got another investigative journalist named Daniel Hopsicker, which is wonderful uh, work that he has, he has delved into. And we've got investigative journalism that's kind of disappeared in this country. You guys are doing a little, little yourselves right now, which is wonderful. You know, we need that more than anything in order to, to maintain freedom in a democracy. Absolutely. And so when did you get, like, when did you start putting everything together? Like, so your brother calls you, well, right? It, it started getting very hairy because my sister, unfortunately, had showed up 
unannounced, you know, she didn't let me know she was coming by the night that the Massachusetts State Police were going to meet with Sean in Clearwater. And uh, she asked me if I'd come along for the ride, and I said, well, I would, but I said, you know, I mean, we can't sit right there. I said, I've got a little camera. I said, I could zoom in and we'll see if, I, we'll see if anything's going on, because we were, we were sure he was going to be arrested. You know, at that point, they were coming down. I thought they were going to take this DNA sample, and they'll just match it right up right away. And they never did, right? And they never did. They they never they claim they never took a DNA sample from him, right? Even they though he claim was the... they didn't, but believe me, from what we th- saw and what I filmed, it sure looked like it. Yeah, you think yeah. they did, and you think you have a picture of that on on your website. That's I saw that. Right. Um, l- let me ask you another couple of questions. Like, where is Sean Mulvey right now? Where, what is he doing? What is his life like? Has he? Se- I mean, h- how many years ago did this he, happen? He now is, he is he is bragging about the fact that he's working for some some part of law enforcement. As you can see, I put the picture on the uh, on the website now. He's got a Ford Crown Victoria with a. You know, like just like the cops drive around in, whether it's CIA or whether or not he's part of the uh, Homeland Security or whatever. Uh, obviously, they've employed him. You know, it's a reward. <laughs> what, is, what is what? What your website's been up for? How many years now? Uh, I put it up in two thousand uh, eleven. Eleven years. Three years now. Oh, how many? Oh, two thousand three years. Three years. Okay. I put it up. I put it up after McGowan. Well, after the uh, Supreme Judicial Court uh, put a thumbs down to McGowan. Okay. So what what is there, have you heard from your brother or your or, or that side of the family, uh, Sean, since you put up this no, website? No, we, we don't, no. no. I stay far away from them. I've, I've actually had my brother, had the nerve to show up here about a year or so ago. Um, where I am now, which I don't, I don't divulge where that is, you know, for a radio, of course. Sure. But uh, at any rate, he actually showed up there, and I had to speak with law enforcement about it. And uh, if he ever did come around here again, he, <laughs> he'd made a sorry mistake. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't speak with them at all, <laughs> for obvious reasons, would you? No, no, I mean, I'm just you wondering know, if, they, I mean, if you've heard anything. I mean, I, I, I'm still in shock that my brother would turn around and do something like that to a family member to put them into what harm's way like this. I'm infuriated with this guy. Yeah. You know. So what did he come uh, to your house for? Hell of a thing, you know? What did he come to your house for? Oh, he thought he was going to be a wise guy. He thinks he's in the mafia. Believe me, he's not any mafia. He's nothing but a big mouth. <laughs> you know, what a horrible person. I'm very, very disturbed with him. You know, and, uh, well, well, I mean, come on, he's convicted of stalker. He was, you know, told to stay on medication. You know, he had to go to probation and all of that. And then he turned around and bought a home right near the woman, who, even after he was told not to go near the woman. And he got within a thousand feet of her house. You know, this is a kook. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, this is why, unfortunately, I got involved, even from the standpoint of flying to Florida, thinking that I was maybe helping her out from, from keeping him away from her. Wrong. You know, sure. not knowing what was going on there <laughs> between him and his son being out there on the Cape in that drug cartel criminals that they ran into with the police and the district attorney and the law enforcement and everything else. This is a nightmare. Do you know they went after everybody? Just yeah. About, you, we, know, you saw the, the, we, well, I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. I want to stop you right there because I do want to get into that. We're going to we're going to get into who all the people that they went after because they have gone after okay. a lot of people. A lot of lives have been changed. But we do have a clip that I want to play because I think uh, okay. I think people need to hear Jeremy Frazier on the stand. Jeremy Frazier was uh, Sean Mulvey's. Uh, no, I guess they weren't that close friends, but I'm going to call him his friend because that friend in the crime, maybe you know, allegedly could have have something to do with this crime. Associate, he, associate. He was on the stand. Right. They were uh, co- co-employees together at this moving company, and uh, Jeremy is getting asked by the attorney for McGowan, who is one of those people. The attorney, some bad things happened to this attorney, and this attorney has been. Uh, fighting the FBI and the police with all of these mafia cases. He's represented many mobsters and shown the government corruption. And hes he, you can tell he's taking it there against Jeremy Frazier. He's asking him some pointed questions. And listen to how weak 
how weak Jeremy Frazier, his response are to these questions about who called you, who owned the phone, just basic questions that Jeremy Frazier definitely does not want to answer. He's on the, he's on the stand. This is during the murder trial. Uh, this is with uh, Bob George, the attorney, questioning Robert George, the attorney, questioning Jeremy Frazier. And we're going to hear Jeremy in his own words. Uh, trying to answer some of these questions that we still don't have answers to. The police have never, the police, the def- the uh, prosecution, uh, D.A. O'Keefe, none of these folks have ever told the public what actually happened here. And, the, and we're trying to find out, and, and this is the closest we get right here, this clip we're going to hear. Do you have any memory today, as you stand in the witness stand, of being asked about that phone number on September 29th, 2011? No. Now, as you read that report to yourself, yep. did you discuss at any time? with the police, that phone number, on your cell phone. I don't remember. Now, before I ask you the next question, you told us earlier that you've been arrested three or four times, but you've never been prosecuted? <coughs> um, I was like, well, that's yes. That's what you told us. All right. Can you tell us what that conversation was about? I didn't talk to nobody. I'm the state police. I'm not going. It's your phone record, isn't it? Right there on the screen? It's yes. your phone record, right? Yes, right? I didn't talk to no state police. And this, is the, this. and this is the state police phone record, exhibit number 70. You see that, right? Yes. Now, it says that you received a phone call from someone at the state police barracks here in South Yarmouth at 12.03 in the night. You don't remember where you were. You see that, don't you? Yes. You seeing all the papers wrong? I didn't talk to no state police before this. Well, well, now that you've seen it, yes, now that you've seen, seen it. it, where did you get that call from at 12.03 a.m.? I don't know. Who Who called you from the state police barracks? Nobody. Okay, you told me you didn't talk to a state policeman, but you got a call from the state police barracks because that's what the exhibit showed. So, who did you receive a phone call if you remember? I didn't receive no phone call from no police officer on my phone at that time. Now, it says that on the record, but I didn't receive no phone call and talk to no state police officer at that time. Well, you see the connection between the phone calls, right? Mm-hmm. You saw that the phone call went through, right? Yep. Was anyone else carrying your cell phone at that time? I don't remember. You told us a few minutes ago that you were making phone calls to young ladies at that point, right? Yes. You told us that you don't remember where you were at 1203 because you were so drunk that you don't remember where you were, right? Yeah. Right? No. So if you don't remember where you were, can you remember who you were receiving phone calls from? No. So you don't have any idea who called you from the state police barracks, do you? No, but you me. I'm saying that. Right. Now, why don't we go back to your record? You could just look at it yourself. Can you show me where on this page there's anywhere that you dialed the state police barracks so that they would call you back? Just on that page. No. You didn't call them, right? No, I didn't. The only thing that shows you calling is your pager, right? Or something you call your pager. That's my pager, yeah. Do you used to call people back in those days who carried pagers? Did you used to call people who carried pagers? I don't remember. You don't? No. Do you used to call state police troopers who wore pagers? No. You see the pager there that says 978? Are you positive that's your that's pager? That's my pager, yes. And you told the police that when they talked with you? That's my pager. You didn't say that? Did you tell them it was your pager? Yes. Or did you just tell them it was a pager? No, it was my pager. But you didn't tell them anything about this incoming call, did you? There you go. Yeah, Jeremy Frazier trying to explain uh, a way why he got a call from the state police on the night of the murder that he answered the call. I mean, it's clear. he it, He's not denying that he had the cell phone in his possession. He just doesn't remember. No. I mean, it just... Did you hear his voice, though? Yeah, I mean, he's just like... No, no. And the best is like when you get that, that like, 50-second pause, and he's like, no. Oh. Yeah. Like, totally. I mean... Who do you think, uh, we're, we're, we're spe- this is the Young Jerks, uh, we're speaking to Kevin Mulvey on WEMF Radio. Who do you think uh, might have called from that state police barracks to Jeremy Frazier that night, Kevin Mulvey? Uh, my, my feeling is, is there's one of two people that, are there that, that, that called him, and that's either the uh, state trooper, Chris Mason, who is now the captain of the state police underneath the district attorney, which is a dirty district attorney, Mike O'Keefe. Uh, was either the handler there for Jeremy Fraser, 
or it's a, another uh, sergeant that's now retired named Thomas Hester, because he's the one who went to Jeremy Fraser's house and took him up to the Tour Police Department while they, at the same time they were uh, um, interviewing Chris McGowan down at the uh, South Yarmouth Barracks. So there's, there's only one of the, those are the only two that I could figure out that uh, he was referring to during that uh, trial. Those are the only two ones, those are the only two people that it could be, one of those two guys. They've got the phone numbers. They've even got the phone numbers to, uh, uh, we're, we're Jeremy called 27 or 26 times, uh, and they never went and looked up that number? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, I mean, I want... One of the state police's uh, cell phones. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> the, the, Robert George also uh, questioned, uh, I believe it was Mason, Oh, maybe it was the other one. There's two cops there, uh, two state police officers. He, he questioned them both, but one of them I, I, I was watching the testimony on, and he was asking them directly about those phone calls. And he was like, "Oh, did you know that uh, you know they were also friends with they worked with Dave Murphy, and he had Dave Murphy's phone from Somerville." And the state police were like, "No, we didn't know. We didn't care. Like they they were like like it was not important. Like it just did not matter. It's like are you kidding me? Yeah." And you couldn't right. figure out who murdered this woman for how many months went on and on and on and on. But you had all this information. You had all this information on these two guys, Sean Mulvey and Jeremy Frazier, who right. it's so obvious that they had something to do with this. It's allegedly. Right. Allegedly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and, and I'm going to actually. I'm, working for the FBI. Yep. And, and Jeremy was state police. And actually, they were being played off each other. I don't think either one knew. Either one was being set up to yep. tell you the truth. And I'm going to give both. You know, I want to make sure we make this statement that Sean Mulvey, Jeremy Fraser, Dave Murphy, any of these people are welcome to call in. To come on our show, uh, you know, you can find us on Facebook.com, The Young Jerks. We will welcome you to uh, speak your side of the story. I am a fair person. If I'm wrong, I apologize. I retract. I always do. I have, I think, done that once in the past. But, uh, you know, typically we're right. I hate to say it. But uh, if, if and, and, and the way I can say that is because they won't have the balls to come on here. And if they really are, like, scary people, uh, you know, really show some balls, gentlemen, and come on the show and admit what happened. Like, it's been how many years it's time for the truth to come out if, if you're you know if you, if you were a victim to this program and you got sucked into it just expose it be, be ballsy and tell the truth because uh krista worthington shouldn't have died this way it was ho- a horrible death the daughter ava was was clutching her mom um the, the way that they found the, the the daughter with the blood on her on the mom's you know laying on the mom i mean it's just a horrific crime and 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 I really do feel like we don't know enough. This McGowan, he may have had something to do with it, but I really do think he was a patsy. It just it has all everything that you tell us. What happened to the Robert George, the the attorney that was just questioning? You saw him questioning Jeremy Frazier. You could tell that he was putting the police and the prosecutors on trial for this. What happened to Robert George since then? The the attorney. Well, unfortunately, they turned around. I can't. I, I spoke with Robert George on several occasions. I spoke with a few people even during and after the trial. It was pretty stunning what was going on. As I said to them, we're being stalked. We're being stalked in Florida. We have these gangs of stalkers. Uh, we don't know who they are, and uh, I, and it's really frightening. I mean, we're prepared for our lives. Uh, this followed me to New York. I finally had to run and, and, and abandon my home in Florida. I had to sell it out without ever going back. We left everything, car, clothes, you know, everything that I ever worked for and lost my place down there and came back to Manhattan. And I ran up against it there, too. I ran up against it in Massachusetts when I was there as well. This is, a, this is part of the FBI's counterintelligence program. They were totally rogue. I went to, to Director Mueller. He sent me to, to, but here's the problem. Director Mueller is one of the biggest part of the criminals out there. He was a Boston federal prosecutor in the mid-'80s when Bolzer was at the, was, when they were at their peak, becoming the new mob when they were taking down the mafia. That's what we have running our country today. Is, the new mob. is Robert George in jail right now? Yes, he's in jail for three and a half years. And, and, they actually sent him up on drug money laundering charges, and it was it was quite a scam. He had a former client that was a drug dealer, I guess, and um, not I guess he was, and uh, 
they used him as an informant to set him up to the thing that he had some money uh, from, the, from the jobs, I guess, that he used to do, and uh, he needed to get it clean. So, unfortunately, Robert George fell for it. And from, from what I've gathered, I didn't go to the trial, I couldn't, but uh, from what I gathered, he was convicted of uh, $20,000 worth of, of uh, laundering money. And he'll never get to be an attorney again, is that right? If he gets out? Obviously. Yeah. I yeah. can't imagine it. Yep. You know, I mean, that's the just... New Bob, the new yep. Bob took care of him. Yep, they took care of him. I mean, he, he had been... Uh... He really putting a dent into the FBI. If you look at his his page and all he did from the seventies until then, I mean, he had really exposed them. He had gotten huge lawsuits against the FBI, and and this continues. You know, Mark Rossetti, uh, the head of the New England mob, just this year. He exposed Mark Rossetti. There you go. He's the one who brought it out. Robert George, yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable, and even even the, uh, the 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 gentleman that wrote the book, uh, what's his name, Sa- um, Mansa. What happened with him? He wrote, well, what book did he write? The name of the book first. Uh, he wrote a book uh, called The Reasonable Doubt, um, and, and uh, something with the garbage man or, uh, on there in, in the title, uh, or with Crystal Worthington. It was something. With, it was the whole story of just the uh, the trial and what was going on. And, and a lot of people, and how people were, had been targeted and whatever. He didn't get into the whole co-intel pro aspect of it, except for the fact that at least he did mention that he had had her diary and it had reminiscent, you know, r- ruminations of co-intel pro. And uh, he also mentioned that in an interview that he gave when he when he came out with his book um, on a Provincetown radio channel. Uh, they went after a lot of people, guys. And what did they go they after him after- for? What did they, the author? Went after him for drug money laundering. No, 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 not, not that was the uh, the lawyer. I'm talking about Pete. Yeah, Pete. No, the author. What happened to the author? They went after the police. Went, after, went after him. After him. Oh yeah. Evidently, he said the police locally turned around and said that an alarm system, which he had just had put on his home, went off um, when he wasn't there. He has a home out in Berkeley, California, too. And evidently, the alarm, or they have to go by whatever they say went off, and they went out and they claimed that they saw a gun uh, when they, hanging out of his closet of his home. Now, I can't imagine that in my wildest dreams, but at any rate, they turned around and, and brought him up on charges because it hadn't been re-registered or licensed a, a, again. And as a result, they almost sent him to jail for 50 years. You know, uh, luckily he got off of it. He had to hire one of Bob George's... Uh, <clears throat> And bosses, um, Bolero. I'm sure you've heard of him. He goes all the way back to the to the, uh, to the four guys that were set up to go to prison and that won the 107 million dollar suit back in 2007 uh, with Julian Bolero. If you remember that, I do. You remember that case? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we do. Uh, so he had to hire that lawyer, and then he turned around and hired Kevin Reddington. Uh, and eventually got off on those charges and got got it squashed. But, I mean, he went through hell. Uh, the jurors, they went after the three that turned around and complained after the, the trial was over about jury bias. Uh, they went after one guy uh, for, from, for computer stuff. So you know, how, how where do you fall into all this, stuff. Kevin? So, like, you got all this, in, you you have all this information, it's out on the web, you know, have you taken it to, like, Martha Coakley? I, Have you taken it to people? Oh, yes. Martha Coakley should be in jail. <laughs> this woman is absolutely, uh, uh, she, it, it, it's a frightening thought to think that she'd even be possibly running for governor. That's really scary. She sent down two of her, uh, her, her police officers from her department to Florida. They were only there for one thing, to, to try to get me to... Shut up. <laughs> Go away. You know, that's all it was all about. I brought along two witnesses that also agreed with me, said the same thing. They don't, they're not here for you at all. Now, she's not a good woman. All right, so you had Martha Coakley's office. You brought it to her. Did you? Who else did you bring He's it to? You brought it to everybody. Yeah, I've seen it. I was it. my congressman <laughs> in Florida. Yeah. Okay. Buffalo Rockus. They turned around and they brought it to, along with a police report from Florida, to um, the Inspector General or the Attorney General's office in the United States. Glenn Fine, and they turned around and got a 
rogue email from from some unknown source, which shouldn't have even had their email, let alone let alone know that we were under an attack like this. <laughs> they they turned around and said to me, "Now that you know where it's coming from, can't you just go and live your life normally now?" That's how it was left with my congressman in Florida. I went to Schumer's office in New York. He was my uh, senator there. I also went to uh, Maloney, uh, Carolyn Maloney. Both of them, they said there's nothing they can do. Get a lawyer. No lawyer in the country, and I talked to some of the biggest ones, guys. They wouldn't touch it. They said it's, it's all corruption from the top to the bottom. Yep. And as, yeah, it's, those are really hard cases to win. I know because you know I've had a friend that was set up by a confidential informant um, where a crime was never committed. He was uh, found innocent, charges dismissed. The confidential informant was a child molester, turned out, and uh, a prime suspect of the Molly Bish murder. His name is uh, actually I, don't even, I, I forgot his name actually, but uh, but you know you get the point. And and no lawyer no lawyer would take the case, the civil case, like the statute of limitations has gone by on his court case. But uh, I mean, this stuff goes on every day, and and I know the, it's it's not worth the risk to the lawyers. It's not worth the risk because they'll end up in jail like Robert George. Look how gifted Robert George was and what he's done, and he still ended up in jail without with. I mean, well, I might put my own gang together to go after all of them. And then yeah, <laughs> I'm seeing what it's all about. Well, I think it yeah, me everything in my life. Yeah. Well, I th- for what? I th- I- for us taxpayers to continue to pay for these criminals? Yeah. you got to be kidding me. And I think that's the point. You know, when, when the average person speaks up, not on an attorney, not uh, the establishment, the average people, that's when things change. And that's what happened with the Whitey Bulger. Like, they, they haven't been able to control... The FBI is powerful. They have all this resource, but they're really slow. When when we break these stories, they can't control them anymore. They didn't want Whitey to get exposed. They didn't want all of these things to happen. Now they're just trying to keep it smaller than it really was. And uh, we're seeing there's more of this going on. It happens all the time, not just in Boston, well, well, all over the country. Bolger, Whitey Bolger was in Clearwater, Florida during the winter. Don't kid yourself. Yeah. I went to the FBI in Tampa Regional on... Um, on March 16th, 2007, terrified. <laughs> and uh, a, a week later, they sent Whitey out to a location where I was blogging on a, on a website. I mean, like that. You know who turned around and really brought him in was the uh, NSA. Yeah, how about that? I had, written, right. I had written to the NSA and the CIA wanting my Freedom of Information Act records. They waited 14 and a half months, and the day they brought Whitey in, they sent me a, a letter saying I could take him to court. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How about you that? Tell me who, you tell me who brought Whitey in. I wouldn't doubt it, because I mean, we're, we're showing that this happens all the time with the NSA, that they get right. involved in these things we never know. 617-700-5100 is the number. We're 500. Just a, oh, uh, what are the, 617-500-7100. Oh, I said the wrong number this week. Yeah. Did I? Oh, you said the right number. No, I week. said the right number this week. Uh, 617-500-7100. Bam. Thank you, Frank. Give us a call. Yeah, give us a call. Uh, the Young Jerks, if, if if you're listening and you want to call and you got a question on this, definitely do give us a call. But uh, we're just about out of time. We do have to wrap it up. I appreciate uh, you coming on here, Kevin. What what can people do to get kind of get the word out on this or, or even follow up on it, find more information? W- w- tell us where your website is. Quickly, what what do you got? My website, my website is called Liberty and Justice United dot org, and that's all one word: Liberty and Justice United dot org. And I've got a lot of information on there, and it has all of the entire, you know, the trial, the case, the situation. I mean, the people in our country have to pull together because we have there is no um, we have they don't live by any law, and I'm talking about any of them. I'm talking about federal, state, county, and local. That they have turned this into their own little, <laughs> their, not little, they've bankrupted this country. And there's absolutely no, you know, there's no morals. Nothing. No integrity. Well, thank very you very much, much, Kevin. Thank you very much for coming on. We really appreciate it. And uh, Listen, guys, please keep us up to date. I appreciate talking to you, and I'm glad that we got a chance to get a little of this out there. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for speaking out, too. Great. Good talking to you guys. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Be good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We are the Young Jerks. We are on WEMFradio.com. That was Kevin Mulvey talking about the murder of Kristen Worthington and uh, a lot of conspiracy there. What do you think, yeah. Frank? I mean, it's just... I... The way I normally think about these kind of things is if, like, you're really, really onto something, then they just kill you. But they don't. But, I mean, they, but like, why were they going to kill him? Just they to shut him up. Him? Just nah. to shut him up. You know? I don't think so. He hasn't been covered in the media until today, really. Yeah? I mean, you know, this is the thing. Uh, I, I, I think that's something there. I mean, well, you got these two guys, Sean, Sean Mulvey and Jeremy Frazier. You I know? mean, these guys were the most likely culprits. When, well, you, when you put up the lineup, and, and we didn't even get to some more information. I mean, um, Jeremy Frazier had talked to another kid, and uh, just months before the Krista Worthington murder, another black kid, it turned out, and uh, said, hey, I want to rob somebody, uh, a lady who's got some valuable coins and possessions, and uh, you want to hold her up? You want to you get in on this uh, job with me? And the other dude said, no. That's classic Massachusetts inst- institutionalized racism right there. You know, we'll just blame it on the black guy. Well, is that, it doesn't seem like that's what they were doing. I Looking mean, for the does, fall guy? It does. Looking it for does the fall guy the and that they had this you know, plan? I'm, I'm no expert on the case or whatever, but definitely, you know, cursory glance, it does look, you know, like as if that guy might have been a patsy, you know? Totally. And and the uh, government cover-up, you know, this uh, this district attorney, I've been watching for a while. I don't trust him at all, Michael O'Keefe. I don't like him. He's one of the most reefer-mad politicians out there. And uh, he he is, like, there's other scandals involving him. And I'm just, like, they covered up this information about Jeremy Frazier and Sean Mulvey throughout this whole this whole jury, you know, verdict, the whole thing, the whole uh, trial. They covered it up. They, they were trying to hold that back from Robert George and the defense. That's shady. That no, is definitely. so shady. Oh, yeah. No, there's no question about it that there's definitely, you know, corruption that's systemic, you yeah. know, throughout the whole entire set. I mean, it's it's gone to the point now where people just accept it, like make movies about it, you know, like, I know. like The Departed. I know. When, you know. One movie after another. I exactly. mean, how many movies you know? do we have to make? And it's that old thing. Uh, Garrett said this once on the show, and I think it's so classic. It's like, yeah, we used to do that, but no, we don't do that stuff yeah, anymore. Yeah, exactly. Except exactly. they do. We yeah. just caught Mark Rossetti and the FBI doing the same thing that they did with Whitey Bulger. Well, they're just desensitizing people to it. That's why it gets put in movies, you know? So that way you see it, and it's just like violence, you know what I mean? Like, if a person, you know from 50 years ago were to sit down and had never seen a movie before, you know, and we showed them Rambo, they'd be horrified. Yeah, they'd you know think what it I mean? was awful. Yeah. They'd think it was awful, and why would you... That's not a so violent. Just murdering people, you know, like, run amok, you know? I mean, or, or like one of these new crazy horror movies. It's just desensitizing people. That's what it's all about. That's the name of the game. So when it actually happens, you're like, ah, and you have no empathy, and you don't you don't get outraged because it's like, oh, yeah, I saw And it that. happens over and over I again. I saw that in the movie. Yep. It's so true. I mean, uh, if you look at his website, there's so many links to this corruption and no one cares. No. Nobody cares. Nobody cares because at the end of the day, going after something like that completely jeopardizes everything that they've built for their whole entire lives. And, like, people aren't... They they, don't want bad news. They don't want bad news. And they're not willing to, you know, put themselves at risk or put the family at risk, you know, in order to to get that resolution. And unfortunately, I mean, nothing's going to change until people all put themselves at risk. Well, you got to stand up, and it, you know, and, and you got to stop being weak. And that's all I'm going to say about it, because I'm not afraid. And I think that these these two, you know, two or three people we talked about today, especially uh, Sean Mulvey and Jeremy Frazier, if you got a problem with what we said today, come on the show, give us a call, we'll have you on. Don't be afraid, and uh, do the right thing. Why don't you tell us what happened? Tell us, tell us why you changed your stories. Tell us about your relationship with Dave Murphy. Tell us about being a confidential informant, Jeremy Frazier. Tell us why the state police were calling you that day. Answer the questions. We are the Young Jerks. We're over time. we got to call, uh, go and come back next week. That's right. We'll be back next week with a new exciting show for you. Every Saturday. Here on WMF Radio. Good night. WEMF Radio.